All right, welcome to our first lesson in module two, where we're gonna be talking about understanding storage account configuration. The objectives for this lesson include understanding what goes into a storage account name. We'll look at different storage account types. We'll look at our access tiers that are available to us, as well as replication options and our disk types. Finally, we'll have a word on billing and what goes into determining how much our storage accounts will cost. First, let's talk about storage account names. When you go to name your storage account, it has to be a globally unique name amongst other storage accounts inside of Azure. That's right, you have to have a unique name against what everyone else has called theirs. So if there's a storage account out there named Jeff's Awesome Storage, I won't be able to use that name myself. These domain names will have a suffix of core.windows.net. There's also gonna be additional nomenclature in there depending on what type of service, and we'll get into that in a later episode. Finally, our storage account name can only use numbers and lowercase letters, and it has to be between three and 24 characters. I bring this up so you can think of some type of standard that you might wanna name your storage accounts. Maybe it has some form of your company name in it, along with the region it's configured in, or purpose like prod, dev, or test. Next, let's talk about our storage account types. The first type we have is general purpose v1. This is the older version of our storage accounts that use the Azure Classic Deployment Model and not the new Azure Resource Manager or ARM infrastructure we have today. Overall, you probably won't be provisioning general purpose v1 storage accounts, but there is one caveat if for some reason you need to use an older version of the Storage Services REST API. Maybe you have a custom application that is currently using this. What's recommended right now is that you use a general purpose v2 storage account. This supports all the latest features and you're gonna get the lowest per gigabyte capacity prices inside this type of storage account. And what's great is if you have a general purpose V1, you can easily upgrade to V2 without moving your data around. It's as simple as a click inside our storage account configuration. Finally, we do have a block blob only storage account type. This is a premium performance for blob storage. We'll talk a little bit more about what blob storage is in this episode and later ones. In general, it's also recommended that if you're just gonna have block blobs storage, to just go ahead and provision a general purpose V2 storage account. Next, let's talk about our access tiers. Again, these access tiers are gonna to apply to block blob data only, and we'll discuss what exactly that means in a later episode. Our first tier is the hot access tier. This is gonna be for frequent access of data inside your storage account. Accessing data in the hot tier is going to be the most cost effective, but your storage costs are going to be higher. Whenever you create a new storage account, the hot tier is configured by default. Our next access tier is the cool access tier. This is going to be for storing your data that is going to be infrequently accessed, such as storing it for at least 30 days. So maybe if you have something that you're accessing once a quarter, the cool access tier would be the one for you. Now, storing data in the cool access tier is gonna be more cost effective for the storage, but accessing it is gonna be more expensive because it's gonna take longer to get access to that data. Finally, we have the archive tier, and this tier is only available for block blobs and append blobs, which we'll look at later inside of our container services. This is gonna be for data that can tolerate uh, several hours of latency when being retrieved, and that's recommended that the data inside the archive tier resides there for greater than 180 days. So you're only gonna to need to access it maybe every six months or so. So this is gonna be the most cost-effective option for storing data long-term that's not being accessed frequently, but it's gonna be more expensive to access the data than what you would find inside the hot or cool tiers. Next, we have replication, because we want several copies of our data in case something happens to it. The first option we have is locally redundant storage, or LRS. This is where your data is going to be replicated three times within the Azure region where your storage account is configured. And really, this means it's going to be stored within a single data center. This is going to be your lowest cost option, but it's not going to protect against a data center level disaster. So if something were to happen to that data center, you wouldn't have access to the data inside that storage account. This is probably gonna be a good option for dev or test environments or for applications that don't require type of redundancy or other options offer. Next, we have zone redundant storage or ZRS. 
This is where data is going to be replicated synchronously across three availability zones inside the primary region. So you're still restricted to a single region, but your data is going to be synced across an availability zone. What an availability zone is, these are autonomous and they have their own separate utilities and networking features. So it can tolerate an outage inside availability zone inside the same region. However, this isn't going to protect against a regional outage when multiple zones are affected. Next, we have Geo Redundant Storage, or GRS. This is pretty much having like LRS in a primary region, and then that data is going to be replicated asynchronously to a secondary region following the LRS format. So basically, you're going to have LRS in your primary region and LRS in a secondary region. And data from that first region will be copied over asynchronously over to the second region. This second region is going to be hundreds of miles away from the primary one. This will protect against a regional outage. However, data in the secondary region is not going to be available for read or write until Microsoft initiates the failover to the secondary region. If you need read access to that secondary region before Microsoft initiates the failover, this is where read access, geo redundant storage, or RA GRS comes into play. Again, you still have LRS in the primary region and LRS in the secondary region, but you're going to have read access to the secondary region and its data prior to the Microsoft initiating a failover for you. We actually have two other replication options, and at the time of this recording, they're currently in preview, so they're not really available for production-ready workloads. But you can definitely check them out now and see how they work for you. The first one is GeoZone Redundant Storage, or GZRS. So like we saw in our last ones where we had LRS in two different regions, this ups the ante by actually putting ZRS in your primary region, so your data is distributed across multiple availability zones, and then that is replicated asynchronously to the secondary geographic region hundreds of miles away. Again, this protects against regional disasters as well as availability zone issues inside the primary or secondary region. And like our other option, you are going to have to wait until Microsoft initiates the failover before you can read the data in the secondary region, or you can take a look at the other option where we have the read access GeoZone Redundant Storage, or RA, GRS. This provides full read access to the secondary zone before that failover is initiated. Next, let's talk about disk types. The first one we have is our standard disk type. This is backed by traditional magnetic drives, and it's going to give you the lowest cost per gigabyte. We also have a premium disk type option. This is backed by solid state drives and it gives you low latency performance. However, premium disks are only available for Azure Virtual Machine disks. And if you put an Azure Virtual Machine disk inside a premium storage, you'll have a 99.9% .9 SLA for those disks. Unlike some other options we have with our storage accounts, you cannot change the disk type after it has been configured for the storage account. So be sure to plan ahead and choose the right option on creation. Finally, let's talk about what goes into billing and how much our storage accounts are going to cost us. The first factor is region, and this is based on the geographic region where the storage account has been provisioned. Different regions are going to have different prices associated with them. Next is your account type, like we talked about, the general V1, V2, or block blob storage. As we also mentioned, we have our access tiers. For example, in our hot tier, it's going to be the most cost effective for accessing it, but the amount of data we store in it and those costs are going to be higher. Next is the capacity, which just refers to how much of the storage account allotment we're going to be using and storing our data. So the more data we put into it, the more we're going to be paying for that storage. We also have replication. As we just talked about in the previous slide, we could just use LRS, and that is our least cost option because the data is not replicated to other regions and data centers. But if your application or requirements require the type of redundancy needed, that is going to cost a little bit more. Next, we have our transaction rates, which refer to the read and write operations to Azure Storage. And finally, data egress, which refers to the data transferred out of the Azure region. So when data inside our storage account is accessed by an application that's not running in the same region as our storage account, you're going to be charged for that data egress. So this is really important when you're setting up resource groups 
to make sure you group your data and services to the same region to limit these egress charges. This means you don't want to set up a storage account inside of East US and then have something from West US accessing that data because you're going to be paying for that egress out to the other region. That does it for some of our storage account configuration options. Let's finish this lesson out with a quick couple of quiz questions. The first one is, which disk type is reserved for storing Azure Virtual Machine disks? The answer to that is our premium disk type. Our next question is, which replication option is the least expensive? This is going to be our locally redundant storage, or LRS. And finally, let's take a look at which access tier would be appropriate if I need to access the data every 60 days. That's going to be our cool access tier. Cool access tier is greater than 30 days, and then moving into the archive tier, which is greater than 180 days. That does it for this lesson, where we discuss what goes into a storage account name, our different storage account types, our access tiers, replication, and disk type options, and finally, what goes into determining our billing cost. Coming up next, we're actually going to take all these concepts, jump out to the Azure portal, and take a look at creating some storage accounts. See you in the next episode.